April, and I'd like to call this advisory committee meeting to order. Um, this meeting is held electronically as per section 19.I of the town's procedural bylaw number 6228-19 as amended due to the COVID-19 situation. And may I have approval uh, for a motion to approve the agenda as circulated by legislative services? May I have a mover and a seconder? Sam and Barry Bridgeford, please. Perfect. Any questions or comments on the agenda? No, okay, I'll call the vote. All those in favor of the agenda as circulated. Those are four, against? Okay, perfect, that carries. Any declarations of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Seeing none, perfect. Perfect. Number four, we're going to receive the minutes. So I hopefully you guys had a chance to receive the minutes from last time when we had that rather long discussion. It was a great discussion. Uh, may I please have a motion to receive the minutes of February 24, 2021? I need a mover and a seconder for that. All right. So Colin is a mover, seconder. Crystal? Wonderful. All right. So any questions or comments on the minutes at all? Does anybody have any questions about that or comments? No, nope. perfect, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries, great, perfect. So we're on the matters of consideration for this evening. So we are going to go to 6.1 for the Energy and Climate Change Analyst Report of the Corporate Environmental Action Plan 2019 Progress Report. I'm excited about this. Uh, may I have a mover and a seconder to put the item on the floor for discussion? So a mover moved by. Barry Bridgeford, second by, please. Stand. Great. All right, so staff, would you like to speak to this item first? Um, sure. Uh, just a quick introduction. Um, so this is our corporate environmental action plan. Uh, it was put together in 2018 uh, between all of our departments uh, were involved in, in the, its development. Um, it's a five-year plan um, that gets updated annually. Um, our first uh, environmental action plan was in 2010. Um, and so this is, was our second one uh, for 2018. Uh, I guess the first one ran for eight years instead of five. Um, and this one we plan to run, to update it at year five, though I was notified that due to budget constraints for the next one, we want to involve a more stakeholder and get um, input from the public, from businesses, uh, residents, for the, the new development uh, of that plan. And so we'll need a bit of a budget um, to, to execute it. So it, it will be postponed by just one year. So it's gonna be in the capital budget for 2023. Uh, so that's like fresh off the press information right there. Um, so uh, in the progress report, so in, in the last, uh, two, in the 2018, um, uh, plan update. Um, it was um, um, decided or put together to, to have a tracking sheet uh, associated with uh, this plan. So it's the first time we have this kind of tracking sheet that goes along with the plan. Um, it outlines a little more detailed, you know, what the action item is, um, who, which division or uh, person is responsible in town for that particular action. Um, a key performance indicator to try to track it. Not all of them are trackable, but you know we try. Um, a kind of time frame for it. Um, anything else? A, yeah, that's pretty much in for the tracking. So, um, so it's the first time we use it, um, and and it was a good tool um, to kind of keep everyone accountable and um, more organized in terms of um, you know where we stand for each action item. So. Um, I would love to hear comments, questions. I will be honest, um, the areas, questions regarding some of the other departments, I'm, I won't have all the answers, uh, but I will definitely take your questions and bring them to town staff um, and, and bring that information back to you. Um, but hopefully 
a lot of the questions are in my area and I'll know all the answers um, uh, you know, to your questions. That's it, so. Thank you, Ms. Keel. I really appreciate that. So I understand the criteria had a whole bunch of other buckets um, uh, as far as your chart with water, storm water management, preservation and electrical and that. So is that the kind of feedback you're asking from the committee tonight within these four buck the, the buckets that were provided in the chart? I just wanna make sure that they understand the kind of feedback that you're looking for today. Um, the feedback really is is wide open. Uh, they we did have the categories um, of the areas. Uh, I think at 2018 um, plan we changed uh, from previous years. Previous years they had it more like earth, air, fire, water categories, and uh, we moved um, to to different um, you know categorization. Um, the tracking sheet is new too, so you know if you have any comments on that. Um, uh, what other feedback? Um, yeah, if, if you feel like um, maybe some of the the, the uh, key performance indicators aren't you know specific enough, or or some areas that we've missed, um, you know, anything you think uh, is what well, anything's welcome. <laughs> That's great. So let's open up to the floor. Does anybody have uh, any comments or questions? Colin? Yes, I wonder, can we um, uh, maybe email questions uh, after the meeting um, or uh, other, that would be good. Um, Definitely. Thank you. Any other questions to maybe uh, talk around this round table discussion here where we'll, we have all of us here, we can kind of brainstorm together. Any questions or comments? Sam? Yeah, I actually have two questions. Um, the first is as, well, they both are as it relates to sustainable ur urban development. The first is a question about the Library Square project. Um, it says we're implementing LIDs. Um, aren't we constructing a building in that project? And are we looking for LEED certification for that building? Great question. Killed? Great question. Um, so yes, we are. Um, the Library Square is an extension uh, to the uh, Tutu Church Street building that we have, the Cultural Center. Um, to say is it a totally new building? Because it's connected, I feel like it's a a large extension, <laughs> um, and it's going to be a performing arts center. So it's actually quite exciting um, project, um, and they'll have all kinds of different um, other areas of activity within the building. Um, so you're right, it is like a building um, uh, that's, that's being built, but there are other aspects um, to the property that are gonna be developed. Um, the parking lot's gonna be changed. Uh, there's a skating rink area, uh, a water feature, um, a lot of landscaping. Um, I think a lot of community space is gonna be happening there. Um, so a lot of multi-use um, going on. Uh, so there are, it is gonna be built to lead gold standard. Um, that's what they're um, hoping to, to meet in terms of the design. Um, some of the LIDs that I took note of um, was like permeable paving was one of the features. Um, some irrigation controls using cisterns. Um, and then some water efficient um, features and water efficient uh, fixtures for the landscaping and for any water features. Um, and then some other like lead design um, aspects that they're using um, like high efficiency HVAC system. Um, um, they're doing a thermal comfort using control standards. So, you know, BIS, um, um, like efficient control use. Um, the building envelope is going to be um, like very high efficient. It's going to be above Ontario building code. So that's really great. Mm -hmm. That's going to keep our heating and cooling load down. 
Um, some sustainable transport features. So um, they have, well, bike racks, that's pretty given these days, I feel, but anyway, um, they mentioned that um, we'll be having our electric vehicle charging stations there. Um, and then some waste and recycling uh, initiatives that are gonna be happening there. Um, so they have like a construction waste plan to minimize the waste from uh, the, the construction side. Um, some, they have minimum recycling content for some of the materials, um, low VOCs, um, daylighting, you know, high efficiency lighting, some of the standard stuff these days. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, and my second question is that in this, uh, the documents provided for the meeting, um, there was no mention of how the town of Aurora is incentivizing new development into these sustainable development initiatives, whether or not, because um, I know <laughs> the town is growing, right? And that's yeah. great, but what are we doing to take a preemptive approach instead of retrofitting 20 to 40 years later? What are we doing to encourage or incentivize new development into those goals because it is just going to cost a lot more money and a lot more time later on. Yep, good point. Um, so I, um, through you, um, Ms. Chair. So I believe there is one of the, uh, one of the um, action items which uh, wasn't completed in 2019, but it got started in 2020 was for the town to develop a green development standard. And that would be the standard for new builds. Um, within that project, and one of the things I added to, that was one of my feedbacks to the project when I was asked for feedback is um, to add an incentive piece to the project so that um, the town can find ways to incentivize builders because we can never force any builder to follow it, right? Um, they have the Ontario building standard. They'll, if they want to, that's what they're gonna do. Um, but there are ways that the town can incentivize builders to follow it. Um, so that will be part of the project. Um, the terms of reference started in 2019 went all in 2020, but um, I believe they've uh, hired a consultant for the project. One of our key staff who was running the project unfortunately just left the town, but it's still moving. I, I saw uh, they did have the kickoff meeting. So um, the project is running. Um, and I think by the fall, we should have the project finished. So um, it, it should be fairly quick um, to get that going. Um, so it, it's on its way, and I, I do believe it's actually one of our action items. It's just, I think I didn't put it in this progress report because we didn't um, have much action on it um, for that year. So um, yeah, so it should be coming in some of the other progress reports. Great comment. Any other questions, Sam? No, besides that, I thought it was a really a really comprehensive plan. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Keel or to the report? Ryan? I just had a quick question. Natalie, you just mentioned that the town doesn't have the authority to mandate that builders do anything. I was just curious about that. Why is that? Um, I was under the impression, I might be wrong here, that East Goldenberry, I don't know if they do it now, but many years ago made it mandatory to build Energy Star for new homes. So I'm just curious as to um, yeah, just why or the reasoning behind how the town doesn't have the, the authority to tell builders um, what to do. Ms. Gill? Through you, Ms. Chair. Um, that is how I understood it, is that we don't have that authority. I can get clarification from our um, uh, senior planner who would, who's running this project and would probably know exactly um, what elements are enforceable and what aren't. Um, but um, yeah, so it's, that's a great question um, that I'll, I'll, I can get back to you on. 
Sure. Yeah, I was just curious. That'd be great though. Thank you. Yeah, because it'd be great to know at least like if there are some things we can enforce, you know, but from my understanding, um, it, it's quite difficult or non-enforceable. Brian? Follow? That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Colin? Yes, uh, I was going to um, ask, I suppose with regard to any projects that Aurora approves, like in the uh, Library Square, um, and I think Councillor Gillibrand, you've, um, you're to, to be credited for this, but there are environmental standards that people have to meet. There's an environmental screening. I'm just wondering how developed that is, because that's certainly a way we can uh, uh, control some of the development that occurs anyways. Ms. Keel? Through you, Ms. Chair. Can you clarify what do you mean um, by the environmental screening like in Library Square? Because that was like a town initiative. So we have control over the project. So it was our own initiative um, to make those changes. That's exactly what I mean. Any projects that we, uh, uh, the town is doing, certainly if people are gonna bid on it, we can say, this is the standard we're holding you to. If you want to be the successful bidder, this is what you have to do. Ms. Kiel? Uh, through you, Ms. Chair. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so in that case, because it, we are the ones, um, you know, designing the building or, you know, requesting the design, we can, we can put the elements that we like um, in there, right? Could be focused on health, um, Health and safety, or something, and in this case, we we push for for the lead design. So yeah, we, we have the control over the project, and therefore, um, you know, um, can make those modifications as long as you know everything is building code, right? As a minimum, and then you know we try to seek something above that um, from the code. Yes. Um, and I suppose with private oh. development, maybe we could uh, have tax incentives. So if uh, private developers want to, um, if they can show, make it worth their while. So it's actually profitable for them to um, develop in, you know, in a green way. I don't know if we do that right now, if we have tax incentives where. Um, there are for certain types of development. And I recently had a discussion with one of the planners for it um, because there was uh, a developer looking to put together a net zero building in Aurora oh. and wanted to know what the incentives were. Uh, so we went through kind of the documentations to see what we can do to support them um, because there are some circumstances that allow it. And I believe it, it was a tax incentive uh, I'd have to check just to double check, uh, double check that. But in this case, um, the net zero didn't fit it. So th this uh, didn't fit the criteria. It was um, kind of like more on the social side, like social housing type thing um, was more part of that incentive package. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, I made the, the recommendation for the next uh, in the official uh, plan review to add um, these environmental designs uh, within that um, criteria list. So uh, we're hoping in that review process, we'll, we'll get this updated and that will support uh, more of these projects. And, and this will be a big one, a big point again for the green development standards when that, um, um, through that process um, to identify these kinds of incentives, either ones that already exist that we don't think do exist at the town and include some that make the most sense um, for Aurora. Some might be tax incentive, it might be like, um, you know, processing time, like processing your um, uh, applications quicker or things like that. There's other ways to incentivize that's not necessarily um, dollar driven uh, that <laughs> still will motivate. Um, so this will be part of the project. Colin, any other follow up? No, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, for the report? 
I have a quick question then, just uh, real quick. Um, I was just talking about the tax incentives, that is a good point. I know that I've had conversations about building codes and obviously this kind of falls more on a provincial and federal level, different levels of government. Um, and we're speaking more of a municipal level and you're talking about adding the, the environmental criteria for designs on our OPR. So just touching on that, because this is kind of a little new information for me, um, at what point does a municipality have in order to um, mandate some of the incentives that Colin was speaking to that, that we could incentify? Like, is there a certain parameters or criteria? Because obviously, um, you know, you have your provincial and your, your federal levels, but is there certain buckets that we have to abide by in order to offer these incentives? Um, I, again, I, I'm not very clear on it. This, this would be um, the, our planning team that would definitely be able to, to answer that better than I can. Uh, okay. And I'll we'll, talk. Yeah. And we'll be part of, I'll a, talk to them. Yeah. So I'll uh, talk to them. And if I find something out, what I can do is I can just email the environmental advisory committee, kind of some of the answers I might've received from that, but yeah, it, it's yeah, definitely a great question because I think we're all trying to figure out what can we do at our level. Um, obviously, we want to advocate, um, you know, to the province and the feds to be able to allow us to do this change with the environmental initiatives out there. And what kind of powers do we have in a municipal level to kind of incentivize? Because I think we're all on the same page for that. So that, that's really good. And I'd like to hear some more feedback from you guys because. Um, you know, this is why we're here is to talk about, you know, where can we do better and what are those areas that can, that can create that impact, you know, on a local level down on the ground. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, through this conversations, is there something there that kind of engages you to want to speak to that? Like we want, we want to hear those uh, opinions as we are developing our official plan, plan review, Ms. Keel is here to give that feedback to planning. So uh, while we're, we're producing this um, official plan to, to allow us to um, form this document that's going to tell us how we want our town to look or run or feel, now's our time to kind of voice that opinion on that. So I really appreciate um, that feedback. Ashley? Uh, yes, I actually had a question. I was noticing that there was some talk of eradicating the invasive species. Um, I actually just was kind of, since we're entering into gardening season, I think that that's actually a topic that a lot of people really don't know much about. Like I was just at a garden center and they're selling an extremely invasive species that people will plant in their front yard or their backyard. Is there a way that we can the town has some sort of like education that we can provide because a lot of people just don't know. And then once they're planted in the ground, like Lily of the Valley, it's, it takes years and years just to eradicate them if it's possible. So is there some sort of education piece or something that we can do to educate the public about common ones that you'll find at any greenhouse? Ms. Kiel, would you happen to have uh, any feedback on that? Um, yeah, I am i don't know much about invasive species. That would be our definitely our parks department. Um, so I'll definitely bring this uh, comment uh, to them. Uh, I will say though, uh, the town, both through our environmental action plan, this plan that uh, was presented to you today, um, we work closely with our communications on different env environmental awareness um, campaigns um, for different topics. So um, th this one can definitely definitely be something that you know um, can we can work with our communications on some sort of uh, education campaign about different invasive species. Um, I mean, if you have a, like a particular um, species that, or invasive species that you know of, um, or or uh, any suggestions on on what we can include in that kind of campaign. We tend to um, use social media uh, for the most part for these types of um, campaigning, though we also uh, work with some of the newspapers depending on um, what's being put out. Um, so yeah, any suggestions uh, would be helpful or um, something I can bring to our parks to take a look at and, and um, for them to kind of make um, you know, their educated decision on. 
Okay. Yeah. There's a, there's a, like a few, uh, I guess I could come up with a short list. Just there's some that are just constantly popping up and I'm part of something else. And it's constantly a battle as gardeners to, to learn the difference, even though we like the plant um, that they're just kind of ex like, even in our, we have, I live off a forest here and there's garlic mustard, there's stuff that shouldn't be there. So, um, okay. Right. Yeah. I guess. I could email or something. So yeah, that's really helpful. Thank, you. Thank you. And if I and if I may, um, I know Barry's pretty well versed in a lot of the invasive species. He's kind of spearheaded a lot of the uh, mitigation of this, and uh, definitely keeping tabs of communication with their parks is, is key. So uh, Barry, if you would like to speak to this, and maybe offline, you and Ashley could put together a list to, to submit to communications and our park department. That would be great. Yeah. So you, did you want to speak to that briefly on this occasion? Uh, I find that in the parks department, there are, have been and are individuals who are very supportive of private efforts. However, uh, I must say our council, while they on occasion do speak uh, sensitively on the issue, nothing comes through of substance. We're really lacking in this area as to anything of substance. Um, I've been involved for years through the parks department on a volunteer basis. Uh, I get frustrated. I see efforts not being, in practical terms, put to application, not appreciated in the practical sense. So it's a case where the province is not much better. They passed a Invasive Species Act, but they didn't put any teeth on it. They didn't put any fines attached to it. So it's basically just an educational document. Uh, there are three key offenders in the plant domain. Uh, we have them all in the town of Aurora, but the town does not have any program other than occasional involvement with Phragmites. When it comes to Japanese knotweed and dog strangling vine, next to nothing. It's a case where the general public is not educated and that's what we need, education, awareness and participation by the public. Now, if I may uh, kind of touch on to page nine of the report under biodiversity and natural heritage, there's reference to adopt a park and community gardens. But even in the tracking document, we don't get a sense of how many of these instances exist to start with and what they are in detail being added in that year. I have a question about, for example, the adopt a park. I signed on in 2019 with an adopt a park agreement. Is that one of the two? If it is, it's kind of meaningless because I had the previous three years already. So are we counting a renewal as a new agreement? There's not enough detail in the tracking for any substance to be appreciated. It's rather vague. Now community gardens, is that where a community group takes this overall responsibility for a small area and works it collectively? Or is that the old British concept of allotments where an individual person gets assigned a 10 by 20 area and looks after it exclusively? We're lacking in detail. And when there's no detail, it's like, what are we talking about? We don't really see what we've had in the year prior as a running total, as a benchmark, and what specifically we're adding in that year. And I think we need more detail if we're gonna track uh, public awareness and participation with any any meaning, and that's the key area. If the if the general uh, populace isn't supportive, then the issue is going to fade. And how can they be appreciative if they're not getting details? If the people who are concerned, both in the political realm and the staff realm and the public realm, don't see the details, then they probably think, well, not much is going on. They can't give us any specifics, so it must be fun with words. I'm sorry to say, I wonder, is it just fun with words or do we have some substance? Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And uh, I'm really happy to hear that feedback and uh, the fact that we're having discussion on trying to update this and move forward with something that's brand new and fresh. It's really important and so grateful to have Ms. Keel on board who's been uh, hired to kind of give us some extra focus in this department and as well as collaborating with Parks and Rec. I know there's been a, a huge demand for um, increasing some community garden space as well, but I agree you want to have you want to have those details. You want to have that data and that and that information. How is this going to be run? How is this going to be tracked? So 
this is this is really good uh, feedback, Barry. And, and I know that you've been actively involved and I do support the fact that we do have some invasive species and uh, I think that we need to do a little bit more. So I, I, I do agree with you on that. I appreciate your feedback. Um, anybody else have any um, questions or comments? Uh, Sam and then Ryan. Um, just slightly adding on Barry's point, I would really like to see the name of the invasive species that was eradicated and just the detail about that. And maybe if it's present in other parks, because I believe it was just eradicated in one, um, maybe that could be a start for an educational campaign to make sure it's not going to come back. Um, that might be a good place to jump off maybe, um, but I would like to know what species it is. May I add at this point? May I respond in fashion? Uh, Barry, yes, go ahead. Um, with invasive species, eradication is kind of a nebulous target. It's a moving target. It's, it's a fallacy. You can't eradicate the species in total. You may eradicate it in an area 50 feet by 100 feet, but just beyond that, it, the seeds are already there. The tubers are there, the runners are there, the rhizomes. It's more like keeping a garden. The, the uh, adopted park I have, it's a small little thing. It's about one and a half acres called Lions Park. And yesterday I spent two hours solid pulling garlic mustard. I'm standing behind my chair here because I was sitting in it and one of my leg muscles was cramping up from yesterday's effort still. It's uh, strenuous work, it's good exercise, but there's a seed bank in the ground. For example, garlic mustard, it produces seed which will live five, six, seven years easy in the ground. So you may have eliminated every bloom in a year, but it's still gonna come up because the seeds from five, six, seven years prior, each year coming up. So it's a gardening process, if you wanna use that word, it's a weeding process. These are invasive weeds. They're not just a case of going in with a lawnmower. You have to pull the plant, in the case of garlic mustard, and the root. In other words, you have to thrust your thumb and index finger way down and pull. And uh, some of them are pretty stubborn. And if you pull too sharp and too fast, it snaps off and the root's still on the ground. So you have to pay attention to what you're doing. And two hours of that is enough for me at one time. I'll be going back, but it's, it's gardening on a park level. It's not erratic. If you want to eradicate it, you got to go in with a chemical. And this day and age, we're not really too favorable about chemicals. It's, it's mechanical, physical weeding labor. Now, how many residents are good for it? I don't know. I, I doubt this day and age too many. I'm retired. I don't get much exercise. This is good exercise for me. But, um, you know, it, when you hear about Phragmites, what eradicates it in a 50 by 100 foot area? Chemicals. If you hire a specialist to come in and eradicate it, he's using chemicals. Sure, he's using very controlled, specific measures because he's registered. He has to follow a strict, uh, you know, set of rules how to use his chemicals. But if you go in there and try and eliminate Phragmites mechanically, my gosh, you're talking. Uh, you need some superheroes. <laughs> Your average Joe isn't going to be able to do it mechanically. They're that vicious, these uh, invasive species. So the general public gets the impression that, oh, we can hire somebody to eradicate it. When you got a five, six, seven year seed bank in the ground already, you don't eradicate it. You weed it as if it was a garden. And it's the same with Japanese knotweed. You have to dig those suckers out because their roots go so far down. Japanese knotweed will get into your pipes, your infrastructure, your foundations, and we're getting milder winters. So that specific species is going to live, survive the winters more effectively. In Europe, if you've got Japanese knotweed on your property, you probably can't get a mortgage. You have to get specialists to go in there and dig it out with a backhoe to a heck of a depth and then certify it as not weed free, then you can get your mortgage. Sounds awful, but we're heading that way because we're getting milder winters and yet nobody seems to care or next to nobody, you know, seems to care. Thank we have it all across. Thank you, Barry. 
so there you go. It's a, a frustrating, arduous uh, task, and the town isn't rising up to it, I'm afraid, collectively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Sam, do you have a follow up at all? Um, yes, over my barking dog. Uh, um, I do understand and acknowledge that. And um, I think that you and I will disagree on this, Barry, in the fact that eradication is possible for some species. And the best, some of the best measures. Um, for invasive species is to prevent the spread of invasive species from park to park. Um, so I think a lot of education could be focused within the town on preventing the spread because weed whacking will eventually, before the pollination will eventually knock out the seed bank, but that is a long-term arduous thing that I, agree needs to be taken very seriously because Japanese knotweed is a threat not only environmentally but to humans. Um, but I think in terms of education of where the town could step up besides physically removing and taking the time to create and manage these invasive species is to prevent the spread um, within the town boundary I think is a very achievable place to at least maybe not start is the right word, but uh, to continue and grow from <laughs> for the invasive species effort. Thank you, Sam. Ms. Keel, I understand you put your hand up. I didn't know if you wanted to respond to that. Uh, well, it was um, from Barry's question, but then um, Sam kind of started providing some ideas. Like I, I was gonna ask, what are some you know, suggestions that the town could do um, to imp improve that. And then you, you, your, you know, Sam came in and provided some good examples, some good ideas. So it's kind okay. of answered. Unless Barry, you had Perfect. any other comments on that. Barry, did you have any comments on that? Yeah, I can comment on that. Um, I was involved and I still maintain online an inventory of the three key offenders, the ones uh, indicated in the provincial legislation. However, in my dog walks and walks about town, I find additional outcroppings, you know, outbreaks of them. So it's like, what do I want to do? Do I want to just uh, inventory these things? Because no one's really paid any attention to the inventory I did establish. I'd rather just enjoy cleaning up the one park I have an agreement over. It's like, I can't be all things, and I could be very frustrated if I tried to be. But uh, the town, I think, has to admit it's got the makings of a very uh, worse problem, because uh, doing nothing is only going to guarantee the spread of this stuff. And uh, that, that's the nature of the beast. It overwhelms our native species. It reduces genetic diversity. It's basically a plague. Um, you can have acres and acres, which we do have Phragmites, uh, south of Wellington in the hydro corridor. Uh, it runs north through the Arboretum. And every square meter of Phragmites is good for nothing. It's not good for any of our native species. It doesn't provide food. It provides negligible habitat, just a hiding place, nothing more but uh, it just pushes out our native plant species and thereby reduces our natural animal species habitat. It might as well be green concrete for all the good it does. So that's uh, basically what we're looking at, the loss of our natural Canadian habitat for birds, animals, amphibians, uh, where kids used to go and play with the frogs and the turtles. Not now, because it's just solid phragmites. And it's being lost every year, uh, square foot by square mile in some places of the country. So it's uh, I'm, oh. I'm not optimistic because I don't see the political will. But so this Barry, if I if I may kind of interject, if it would be safe to say, and you know maybe we can have an offline conversation about this later. Um, I know that you've been very passionate and involved in this before uh, my term, so. I'm a little bit, uh, you know, new to this uh, 
position as far as you know um, your involvement here, but is it fair to say Frag Mighty's garlic mustard, Japanese knotweed, probably the top three contenders? And then maybe we can have an on offline conversation where we can compile kind of like a list of those um, invasive weeds um, as a suggestion. I don't know what you guys think, but maybe there, there could be um, uh, some sort of a communication campaign to the public of what they can pick because sometimes people don't even know what they're allowed to pick you know and with this stigma of you know trilliums and certain things that are out there it's like oh no no you can't touch that because you're not allowed um you know there's a lot of people that don't even know how to identify it and you know we have these cleanup days i know covid's a thing right now and you know we can't necessarily be promoting going out and orchestrating all these days but uh, you know, we have these cleanup days for garbage, maybe we could coordinate if there's like a, a specific time. And I think there's some collaboration that we could have with you and some other members or it's the members in general, maybe we can have a round table discussion next time about the best time to go out and errat help eradicate or mitigate the growth of this and organize some town cleanup days with an educational sheet of we're going out on this weekend and we're going to target um, these weeds and the pick and kind of just just like you would with a bag for some you know garbage that's in the park you're doing it now for weeds and maybe that's something that you know the town could take an initiative on and calling on volunteers and I I kind of feel like that maybe that would incur some more common education around people because a lot of people go I don't even know what garlic mustard looks like I don't even know what not what looks like so as we do these kind of cleanup days or weed days, you know, maybe that'll start filtering off more educationally. I don't know. That's just a suggestion. I don't know what you think, but uh, I'm, I'm if I may, to, uh, I would be remiss if I, didn't, I would be remiss if I didn't promote an online resource that I've developed. Uh, if you go to greenaurora.ca, it's a put website. it in the chat. Pardon? Green Aurora. You can put it in the chat. Online. Internet, yeah. And uh, there's an associated uh, Facebook group page, both for uh, greenaurora.ca and for Lions Park. So that's a kind of a resource information source you can you can utilize to your advantage, I believe. Um, I just wanted to add that. I thought, oh, I better get that. Perfect. In. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Brian, I think you had your hand up and then Colin. Yeah, I just had a general question actually related to the community and corporate action plan. Um, so last week, the federal budget, the federal government released their, their budget, um, included a lot of funding for environmental initiatives. Um, so one of them was also, I think it's a million energy guide homes they want to have rated. There's a ton of money in there for uh, retrofits for homeowners. I'm just wondering if there's anything in there that the town is able, if there's anything in there that was for the town or for towns in general to tap into through the FCM. Um, or is there any partnership opportunities between the federal government and their announcement and um, really trying to achieve some of the targets that Aurora is trying to achieve through their different plans? Ms. Keel? Um, through you, Ms. Chair. Yeah, that's a great um, um, announcement uh, last week. Um, I don't know all the details. I know that's uh, on my list to go through and see what's available for us. So I, I do remember seeing um, uh, there's some grants available for uh, building retrofits, energy retrofits for um, rec centers and community spaces. So that's something we're definitely going to look uh, into. We actually um, applied in 2019 for funding with the federal government um, for uh, energy retrofits, and we did not get the funding. In that case, um, but we'll try again. If there's money, uh, we'll <laughs> we'll we'll look for it and we'll try. Um, so so that's uh, something we'll look into. Uh, this energy guide, I I don't remember seeing that uh, announcement. So I'll look for it and make sure that um, the consultants who are working on the uh, green development standard are aware of it um, of that you know, potential funding. And if, you know, if the town can work with developers uh, in any way, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah I can just, I, could, I was reading up a little bit about it, but it looks like they want to do a million um, inner guide homes rated across the entire country over, I think, a seven to 10 year period. And then homeowners would be eligible to get up to $5,000 in incentives towards their upgrades. Um, so those types of initiatives could really fit into uh, just some of the plans that I know you guys have been working on, so. 
Um, and it's about two point, I think it's two, two to three billion dollars they've assigned for that. That's great. Yeah, that would really go well with our corporate, uh, our uh, energy plan that we just our, uh, yeah. passed. Yeah, the community yeah. energy plan. Yeah. Um, yes. Definitely, if there are some incentives available for homeowners, we're going to want to promote that and, and encourage our residents to participate. Um, there are some uh, incentives for residents already with the utilities. Uh, it, it, there are some hoops that residents have to go through um, to get the funding. I, I, I was one of those residents, not in Aurora, but in Newmarket. Um, it, it's not the smoothest, uh, straightforward process. Um, so I, I'm curious to know uh, what the, the federal government is going to be doing, and, and hopefully they've made some improvements in that process and, and make it easier um, um, for people to access that, that funding. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I just wanted to kind of let you know that in the chat, uh, Ashley had shared the greenaurora.ca and Sam had also offered some comments there as well. Uh, do also uh, work closely with the AE Lakes and Conservation Authority. Um, Councilor Gartner does sit on the Lake Conservation, uh, Lim Simple Conservation Authority, and I'm sure that um, she could probably ask some questions on our behalf about uh, an education piece or some sort of uh, in, uh, how the town can maybe work with them with this, an initiative to kind of um, combat the invasive. So thank you for that. Um, Colin, I think that you had your hand up earlier. Well, yeah, I, I was, as I was listening to Barry talk, I, I was thinking uh, it would be great to get Barry into the high schools or with some high school teachers and get the high school students to use their community hours. Um, so it was sort of along the lines that you were talking about having an, an action day where people come out. But I think to educate these younger people and somebody with knowledge like Barry, I don't know too much about it invasive species, I haven't really looked into that too much, but um, I think that would be good to get them involved, to get them, uh, and I know you've got enough to do with your time, Barry, you don't need suggestions from me, but um, just occurred to me. Thanks, Colin. Um, and I, sorry, if I could pick up on something Ryan said too, like, um, uh, I'm wondering, can the can the town itself, um, I don't know how much money we have for this kind of thing, but can we give residents uh, incentives to um, make their houses more environmental, maybe have solar paneling or something like that, or, or is there just not the money for that sort of thing? Ms. Gill? Um, Procedurally, I'm not so sure that's something the town can do, but I'm gonna let you. <laughs> so um, there are, um, some cities who are developing um, energy retrofit programs for the residents. Uh, Newmarket is one of them. Um, and what they're offering, it's not directly necessarily um, that the town is, is providing the funds or the incentive to do it. Um, they're more like coordinating between, um, uh, for example, a utility company could provide that incentive and work with with the town to, to, to create a more specific program um, where residents could um, make the investment and then pay back that investment back to either the utility company or uh, to the town. Um, so th th there is a movement for that. City of um, Toronto has it. Um, it's spreading. I think Markham is looking at it. Um, Newmarket is definitely, uh, you know, um, on the path to create this type of program for their residents. Um, so for example, um, you know, a resident can say, okay, well, I'm gonna retrofit the whole house. I'm gonna change the windows, insulate the roof, um, uh, put solar panels on my, on my roof, uh, change my, you know, furnace to high efficiency. And um, it would be like a, like a loan the loan would be um, put on, on on the home instead of the homeowner. So, uh, you know, and then every month the, the homeowner would pay back um, part of that loan back to the town. So it is being developed uh, and we are looking, that is, you know, one of the outcomes from our community energy plan is to investigate this type of program for Aurora. Um, so it, it is on our, I think, 2020 three capital projects. I have to 
double check what year that's going to be happening, um, where we're going to be investigating the options that we would have here in Aurora. Like, could the town be the one, you know, organizing this kind of program, or do we need to go to a third party, like with the utility, um, or even, you know, partner with another town like Newmarket, for example. Um, and then, you know, uh, we would, you know, detail wh what that would look like and, and um, you know, what resources would be available um, to develop that type of program. But we'd have to have a, a business case um, to support it. Um, like the town itself cannot pay for this type of program. It's just so immense and expensive, right? So there'd have to be some sort of business case to, to support it. And it would have to be like a very long-term program, right? Um, you know, pay, paying back these types of loans would be, you know, 20 years or so. Um, so, so definitely good comment. Um, and we are looking into it. Thanks, Natalie. Appreciate that. Yeah, the community energy plan, I know that I was, uh, I sat on the same committee with uh, Ms. Keel. And one of the big things was the buy-in and the incentives in the community and, you know, incentivizing people to make that switch. So that's definitely one of the big things moving forward and how we're going to make change because it does kind of center around us as the consumer. So uh, I appreciate that acknowledgement and that uh, it's real and, and we do need to have that change happen and how we draw that from and where the funds come from to make that change is important and we need to keep talking it out. So that's great. Um, just to kind of touch on some of the buckets to maybe um, dial in on some of the items here. There's the environmental awareness bucket, climate change, energy. Um, it was very interesting seeing on the chart about the energy consumption within all the areas within the town facilities um, with natural gas and hydro. Seems to be kind of unchanged between both. Um, biodiversity and natural heritage, waste reduction and diversion, uh, sustainable urban development, which was touched on by Sam, and water conservation. Um, any other questions or comments about the report or feedback moving forward as we develop something? Sam? And then Barry. <laughs> um, never ending. Uh, but I was just wondering if the town had taken into consideration under their biodiversity for these parks and these new plantings about tree genetics. Um, and it's something I'm learning about in my education currently, but that uh, often nurseries will take grafts of trees, uh, which means that the trees that are present in nurseries are often genetically identical, which makes them really susceptible to blights like emerald ash borer and other things. Um, so I'm just curious if the town, some nurseries, if you propagate from seed, that's how you get genetic diversity is by collecting seed in different places. Anyway, so there are some nurseries that do that. And I was just wondering if the town would be, well, was aware of this. And then if they would be interested in looking at more genetically diverse nurseries if they're acquiring trees. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Sam. I love it. Uh, Ms. Kiel, I don't know if this is your bucket. I wish I had Al here to talk to that. But um, have you had any conversations um, with that department in this regard? No, this is uh, brand new information to me. So I will write that down and uh, talk to our parks department on, um, on, on the topic. Perfect. I, I love it. I, I often advocate for biodiversity. I know that they're very uh, keen on trying to diversify the canopy that we have and also choosing plant uh, trees and shrubs that are more native to our area and obviously that are less susceptible to disease. But the genetics, that's another thing to consider. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Barry? Do you have any final comments, Barry? I'm sorry, you didn't have your hand up? No. Oh, okay. Um the, the issue of uh, community gardens, can we just clarify what the town's committed to? Is it community gardens or allotments? Um, personally, I'm not really sure. I'd like to stay in my lane here. Uh, Ms. Keel, do you have any information on that or shall we defer to Al and get back to you on that? 
Yeah, I agree. We're gonna... I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Find out that information and get back to you. Perfect. And I see that Sam has put some information if anybody's interested on in some great resources, perhaps staff maybe can take some notes down on this resource that Sam shared on genetic uh, diversity, that would be great. Any other comments or questions to the report? Crystal? Yeah, I also had a question about trees. Um, I was just wondering, we're monitoring or looking at the number of trees planted. But I wonder if there's any monitoring being done with like survivability, even just in the first year, how many of these newly planted trees or shrubs are actually surviving. Ms. Keel, did you want to chime in there? Um, I, I don't I don't have an answer, but I think that's a great um, question. And I, I would assume that the town does monitor that. So I can see if we can maybe start including those numbers if they're available to the report. Um, and then that way, you know, you could always see from the previous years, you know, what what was planted and then what was survived. Um, so yeah, I, it's a great question. Thank you. Crystal, any follow-up on that? Um, no, not really. I just think, yeah, it would be great to know that it's actually making a long-term difference um, that we're actually seeing sort of a uh, good amount of survivability every year with the number that's actually going in the ground. Perfect. It would be awesome if we had Al here on a no. committee call one day. Maybe uh, next month we will put in an item on the agenda to maybe have a deeper conversation on this. I know he has a lot to talk about with this. And I know we're due for a diversity canopy count, as they say. I don't know what the technical term is, just to kind of give us an assessment of where we stand with our diversity or of, of our trees, um, because it is important to have diversity within our canopy. So great questions there. I know that they try to um, plant trees that do um, survive and carbon capture. That's a big thing I've been advocating for as well. And obviously we're trying to eradicate tree or mitigate our, ourselves from planting trees that don't have that good sur survivability, but um, having that document and data is, I think, what we need and we're looking for. So I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions or comments to the report? No? Perfect. I'll oh, just I want to, yeah, go ahead. I, mean, um, I think based uh, from this conversation, so um, the two, this report that we reviewed is 2019, which is a bit delayed. The 2020 um, progress report should be coming this in the June meeting. So I'll make sure someone, um, either Sarah or Al, come to the meeting um, because you know it's still going to be those same action items. So then you know we can have um, someone from that team, uh, you know, with their expertise, uh, provide us with more information. Um, I'll I'll get I'll, I'll gather all of this you know prior to that. Um, but I think it'd be great to have someone in this meeting, um, um, you know, to support um, any questions on biodiversity. That's perfect. And uh, I, I love that you're here as well. Um, Ms. Keel is, uh, a lot of the expert from her is uh, um, stormwater management and um, greenhouse gases, energy. We've had many talks on hydrogen, electric, um, it's uh, it's great having you here to touch on you know these subjects with the um, the infrastructure part that sometimes nobody sees and obviously we'd love to have Al and Sarah here as well to talk about the uh, the environmental part with respect to trees and plants and whatnot so that's great. Um, anybody uh, have any other further questions or comments? No, great. All right, so I'll I'll call the vote. All those in favor of receiving the report. Any opposed? No, that carries. Perfect. All right, well, we have no additional items. Um, before we adjourn, I just wanna say thank you very much for all your input today. And I do wanna announce that council did pass the um, IV electric vehicle stations. So that was a big win. I know there was a heck of a lot of discussion around the council table about that. So we will see um, a whole bunch of electric chargers at various town facilities and also including Library Square. So this is a huge step forward 
and um, giving and making sure that our community has access to alternative energies, all in reducing greenhouse gases. So this is a great step forward. So um, thank you very much for all your hard work on that. Um, beautiful. May I have a motion to adjourn? Sam, seconder, and Crystal. All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. And we shall see you in, I believe, June. And Ms. Uh, Ms. Clerk, uh, uh, could you confirm what the, when the next date is so we can kind of, before we dial out and say goodbye to everybody, could you confirm the next date? Absolutely, it's for you, Madam Chair. The next meeting is gonna be on Wednesday, June the 23rd at 7 p.m. Perfect. All right. So mark your calendars in advance. When this comes back, um, you'll 